Hi. Hi, Huskies. Good afternoon. How are you? Thanks for coming. So uh, many of you attended uh, the fall town hall meetings, and uh, this is the spring version, and we're doing it a little bit differently this semester. Uh, instead of going unit to unit around the university, we're going to tr try and do a couple big ones, and, uh, and then there's a number of people online as well, and if those who couldn't attend, uh, they can go back and look at the archive and watch that. We'll have an FAQ as well. So the questions we'll collect today, we'll answer as many as we can, and if they don't get answered, we'll answer them on the FAQ and, and get them out that way. So uh, Brad Hoey will be staffing the computer over here, and people are sending things in. Agenda. Uh, I want to cover what we know about the state budget, which is about not very much, but I'll tell you what I do know and what we can expect over the next few months. I want to talk briefly about the strategic plan. Did you pick those little pamphlets up on your way in? Good. There'll be a quiz. Uh, I want to talk about recruiting activities. Um, Ann Burbrick is going to talk about retention activities at the institution. Uh, Lisa, is going to, Lisa Freeman, provost, is going to talk about program prioritization and then questions, anything you want to ask. So there's the plan. Okay. I like this picture. So that's the rotunda in Springfield, and that's money floating somewhere. So this may be a metaphor. So we had an election. We have a new governor. Governor Rauner has looked at the budget and said, uh, it's not in balance. And I think we all knew that. That may be why he got elected. Um, so you're going to see a lot of interesting political drama the next four, five, six months. The state budget is not in balance. And it wasn't in balance before the election. So uh, the state was about four million, four billion, that's a B, four billion dollars behind in their payments before the election. So when we get an allocation from the state at the beginning of July, they start sending us money, but they send us roughly a quarter late because they've got cash flow issues because they're four billion short. So in December, um, or on January 1st, the temporary tax increase that we had in place that was whittling that down from 12 billion to 4 billion, that's a pretty big drop, uh, that tax increase went away. It expired. So now that deficit's gonna grow unless something happens. And that something that is gonna happen is there are gonna be reductions in the state budget and there's gonna be some kind of revenue enhancement. That's my prediction. It's kind of like, how do you lose weight? Well, you eat less and you exercise more. It's not a secret. How do you fix a budget deficit? You spend less and you get more revenue. That, it's not a secret. Now, the secret is, what are the political dynamics that get us to a compromise where this all passes? So we've got a dominant legislature, dominantly Democratic legislature and a Republican governor. And the governor on February 18th is going to present his proposed budget to the legislature and then they will say thank you and then they'll go do what they do and then there will be some kind of negotiation in there to get the budget balanced so you're going to hear all kinds of proposals from both sides and some you're going to be really happy with and some you're going to be scary so when you hear that stuff realize this is part of the political drama that's got to play out as they find out where in the in the uh the diet and exercise metaphor that they're working on the revenue versus expenses side of the ledger, where it's going to end up. So what does that mean for us? Let's say we had a 10% budget reduction coming out of all this. I'm just picking a number out of the air because it's easy to multiply. How much money is 10% for us? Well, we have over a $400 million budget. That includes all of our auxiliary services, tuition revenue, state revenue, foundation money, donation money, et cetera, grants and contracts, over $400 million. The state portion of that is $93 million. So 10% reduction would be 10% of $93 million, would be $9.3 million. See how the math there? Perfect. That sounds like a big number. Last year at this time, we had a $15 million deficit on this campus. And we balance the budget, and we balance the budget through the hard work of uh, the core budget team, the CFO, uh, Nancy Suttonfield, and Provost uh, Freeman. 
they worked hard on putting together budget principles, working through governance, working with the deans, with the vice presidents, and we did it by reducing operating budgets where we could, and, and then not hiring all the open positions that we had open. And we closed a big budget deficit. That was heroic work. So my thanks to them for doing that. We didn't have layoffs, we didn't have furloughs, and we didn't close programs. That's a big deal. Now we've got another challenge. We've got another, I suspect, cut coming from the state. That's my prediction. So we're gonna have to close that deficit. And we're also facing some enrollment challenges that are gonna cause us some revenue issues as well. So we need to look at how we spend our money and how we do it most effectively. We've got, what, 3,500 employees roughly, and on average, about 10% per year leave the institution. Retirements or taking other positions or what have it. So that's 350 people, ballpark. So last year, we were able to hire uh, a bunch of those, but not all of those, and that's how we closed the deficit with some operating reductions. We're gonna have to look at that again, but in the long run, as we do that, we're leaning the institution out. We're asking all of you to do more and more with the same systems that we have. And that can wear us out pretty quickly. Uh, now, do we have the right systems in place? Can anybody think of a process or a policy or a system that has too many steps or takes too long? I'm guessing yes. We could probably do a focus group and come up with a few ideas on things that we could work on. Let's work on those. So as the turnover happens in the institution, and, and if we do have to face a budget reduction, uh, we work on systems that work more effectively and make life easier for all of us. And, and that's gonna be an important piece as we go through uh, uh, process re-engineering at the institution along with program prioritization. Did you all get the strategic plan, the little pamphlet? Universities usually write strategic plans that are hundreds of pages long. We've got two. It's not a traditional strategic plan. Strategic plans for universities are often documents that look a lot like um, Google directions written out on which corners to turn if you're, you're driving from here to T Tierra del Fuego. You know, there's a lot of steps. And if you set a goal and say five years from now, we want to get there and you gotta go left at this street and then go right and then go four miles and turn left and vector this, it gets really complicated and you get lost. Our environment's changing too rapidly for us to write a strategic plan like that, that looks out five years and tells us every little thing we gotta do between there and now. You know, we could start down that path, but you might find there's a ditch across the road that the map didn't tell you about, or there's a building there, or the road's washed out, or whatever. So instead of a detailed set of directions, we need a compass. And so this triangle is our compass. This is how all of us, wherever we are in the institution, can take on uh, the, the process of thinking about how do I fit in the institution? What are the strategic and tactical actions I can take in my unit to help us move forward. So this is uh, something that the, the leadership team uh, uh, has been working on since last summer. We've had three retreats with uh, deans, uh, chairs, department and, uh, administrators in non-academic areas across the institution working on these kinds of issues. So that document builds on career success, student career success, and the pillars under that, some core values that came from our strategic plan that had been previously written that are pretty good. And then this model and some principles under it. So it really talks about trying to hook students, academics, and the outside world together and be uh, tied together through the supporting services of the institution. So we often think about high quality students, we think about high quality faculty, we think about their relationships with each other, but that can be much, much richer if you include their activities with the outside world. And you've heard me probably talk a lot about mentoring and internships. There are a variety of examples here. And all that needs to be supported by these outside, uh, or by our internal support services across the institution. So let me give you a few examples. So in, in the top left corner there, you see uh, uh, Reed uh, Shearer, 
Professor Shearer is in the Antarctica. Did you see him on the web page the last couple days and in the news? Uh, global news. Uh, last year, uh, these guys and uh, Professor Powell and the graduate students uh, drilled through the Arctic ice into an under uh, ice lake and found microbes living there. Nobody knew microbes lived a half a mile under the Arctic ice in a, in a lake. And now this year they were working on the ice sheet right where it comes into the continent in the Antarctica. And they drilled down thinking about the, the physics of the ice sheet and global warming and how that's going to affect sea rise. And when they got through the ice to that little edge, they found fish. And there weren't supposed to be fish there. So now they've got a biological discovery, not just a, the physics of the ice sheet. That's pretty cool. And that's supported by the National Science Foundation. And those graduate, now back to the triangle, those graduate students working with the faculty and the outside world through the uh, NSF funding are having life transforming experiences. Can you imagine graduating from here and then going out and being at the very cutting edge of that kind of research? Man, what a great way to start your career. And they're getting all that hands-on experience, life transforming experience. Let's see, who else is on this picture? Oh, uh, the young woman on, in the top right corner there, uh, uh, Alex uh, Kazmierczyk is one of our College of Education students. And Alex uh, did some student teaching last year in Houston, Texas. And I've heard her speak on this, and she said she was really uncomfortable going there. It was not uh, the neighborhood that she grew up in. It was a very Hispanic neighborhood and a low-income neighborhood. And uh, she was getting out of her comfort zone. And she went down, uh, she stayed with a the family there, did student teaching, and at the end concluded that she, she really wanted to teach in that district and spend her life there changing those students' lives and working with their families. So the district offered her a job. And she and her husband are moving there this summer. And she's going to take up a career working in that district. Again, this is an example how a faculty-student relationship blossomed into working in, in this case, uh, an a uh, economically impoverished district. And she's found her way in life. Uh, what a great way to start a career. Outstanding, and I'm so proud of her. Uh, bottom left, Hesed House. Uh, th that's the homeless shelter in Aurora. Has anybody been up there? What an impressive place. And uh, there's a clinic across the street from it for the folks in the Hesed House, uh, mental and physical health. And we, our law school's been working some there, and they found that the clients who are homeless, some have mental health issues, have very little understanding of what their Medicaid uh, opportunities are and how they can get funding for services and whatnot, and how would they know? So uh, our law students uh, and uh, our faculty have started a law clinic there right next door to the medical clinic in the same building. And so when the clients come in, uh, they get those kinds of services. The students tell... Um, pretty emotional stories about the impact that work is having on them. Uh, one told me that they, that uh, she learned doctrine in DeKalb. She's learning how to be a lawyer and live her life at Hesed House. That's, that's pretty powerful stuff. That's what we're supposed to do as academics, to help students transform their lives. So again, the triangle working. Faculty, students working with the outside community, supported by all the support staff that we have. Navistar, bottom right corner. Um, College of Engineering and Engineering Technology is doing an on-site master's program at Navistar. If you've followed them, they make Freightliner trucks and whatnot. They made a big bet on a, a new engine design. It didn't work out well. The recession hit. They had some pretty tough times. They needed training for, the fa for their uh, staff to get back up and to turn the company around. Our College of Engineering is doing that for them in situ, in, in their facility. So that makes it easier for them, for us to take a faculty member there that, rather than bringing all their folks here. Uh, and they're very, very grateful that, again, we've linked the triangle together. We're helping transform in, in, uh, that organization and rebuild uh, the jobs and the prosperity for that company. And over time, if they become successful, wildly successful again, I suspect that they will thank us. And maybe they'll hire some of our students, and maybe they can
provide scholarship dollars for students and support for faculties and programs. These are the kinds of relationships we want to build in this triangle. So your charge is to go back and read the strategic planning framework. Think about that as a compass and how do you use that compass in your area? Where do you fit and how do you make those linkages and have those transformational opportunities? Okay. I'd like to talk a little bit about recruitment and then uh, Vice Provost Burbick's going to talk about retention. Uh, our enrollments were down again this fall and this spring. We're at 19,000 students even. It's not where we want to be. We've got to turn that around. We have to turn around because we're not fulfilling our mission. There's so much educational need in this country and in this state. We're not bringing the students here to have the transformational experience at Hesed House or uh, in the classroom working with the faculty or the staff. We really have to recruit and retain. And we're working on, in a, a variety of areas to do that. I know you're working in colleges and other units around the university, but it takes all of us to do it. So I want to talk a little bit about a few current recruiting activities. Here's some of the players at, at the university level, and I know there's a lot of work going on in units around the university. So on the left, we have academic affairs. Academic affairs is working on recruitment and retention issues. On the, on the recruitment side, we're thinking about our programs. Are they designed the way they should be? Are they relevant? Even our general education program is under redesign, and we're getting close to that. We've got proposals for the NIU Plus program, pro progressive learning for undergraduate studies. Excellent work. Uh, at MLK week last week, a number of students asked about how, how we build more diversity into that. Excellent question. So we're going to be working on that. Uh, it was already in the works, but I think their conversation is going to enrich uh, the design. Uh, marketing and communication is looking at how do we communicate to our stakeholders to recruit students. Uh, you know, which are the audiences? What are the messages? How do we get across these transformational experiences that our students can have here? How, how do we really change that image in people's minds so they know what a great place we've got? How do we coordinate what we're doing centrally with colleges and departments and other units to get that message out? Uh, enrollment management, uh, those are the folks, the, the recruiters that are out there doing their work. We're re-looking at how we spend our financial aid dollars so we can help the most students in the best way. Uh, a lot of hard work there. We've also been doing a lot of work on our processing system so we can make the turnaround time shorter and get back to students as quickly as we can. And then finally, uh, right before the holidays, we signed a contract with Lipman Hearn to help us with this work. I think we're at a place where we need that kind of support. And this is one of the top uh, marketing uh, and communication firms in higher education. And they're headquartered in Chicago. So wonderful. And uh, they had us do a few things just in their first week. They had us working on some things. Uh, they asked us to look at things that could potentially affect our spring enrollment. You know, they only had a couple weeks with us, but they said, what could we do to even affect spring? So they said, go identify all the students who have stopped out over the last four years. That means a student was here, and then they stopped out. They're not here now. And they said, also look at all the students that were admitted over the last four years, but they're not enrolled now or anywhere else. Okay, so they showed interest in us, they just didn't show up. Or students that were interested, but they never fully applied. They got partway through the process somewhere and they didn't apply. How many people do you think that would be over the last four years in those three buckets added up? Any guess? 120,000. That's a lot. So of those 120,000, 30,000 of them are enrolled somewhere just not here. That leaves 90,000 not enrolled. So Lippman Hearn said, that might be low hanging fruit. So on December 26th, we sent an email to 90,000 students saying, hey, do you have any interest? 44 people applied, like that, almost immediately. And I think 24 ended up enrolling. Now the ratio of 90,000 to 24 seems pretty small, but it was a week, right? That's, that's pretty amazing. We think it's going to have a big impact in the coming year. That's one of many things we need to be working on. But that, 
that's an example of how we need to go out and do more aggressive recruiting. That was back into students that uh, are not enrolled anywhere. We're also working uh, with community colleges. So that top left picture is of me and the president of uh, Lake County Community College, uh, who's a Husky. And we're signing a reverse articulation agreement. For those of you who don't know that terminology, it's a deal where a student might go to a community college for three semesters and then transfer here before they get the AA. And then they transfer the credits they get here back to the community college and get the associate's certificate or degree. And that's good for the student because they might be in a program where they need to be here that fourth semester and not back there because of the course offerings. So it speeds their time to degree. It gives credit to the community college because they had th there were three quarters of the way there. They got to get some credit for that. And for us, it's good because we get the student into a program in a streamlined fashion. So uh, we've signed a number of those, Kishwaukee, Wabunzi, Lake County, or I mean uh, Rockford, Rock Valley Community College, a number of others. So we're working hard on those. Let's see, some others that we're working on. Uh, we're working on NIU bound, identifying prospective uh, students at community college level and building relationships with those students to really streamline their access into the university. Uh, that's the top right. Uh, bottom right. Uh, the College of Engineering and Engineering Technology is working on uh, enhancing engineering pathways and they're introducing middle school girls to STEM. And our hope there is that they create this pipeline from middle school to high school to community college or us and on through and hopefully they get to us in there. And this is a picture of some high school girls who had been in the middle school program but are now in high school wearing their mentoring t-shirts. And they're mentoring the middle school students. So we're trying to build those pipelines on through and we can probably do that with the college students back to the high schools and on. Those are the relationships that really bond the students here and attract them I think. Uh, other colleges, Health and Human uh, Sciences has got an online completion program for students who have an associate's degree in hospitality management and want to get the baccalaureate degree. Uh, again, that's the triangle, you know, working with people outside and trying to have relevant degrees for them. Um, uh, Kishwaukee has a new student peer mentoring program, Kishwaukee Community College, aimed at encouraging mentees to attend NIU after getting their associate's degrees. So lots of good stuff going on there. So we've got community colleges, we've got businesses that we're working with, we've got high schools and middle schools, we've got work going on uh, with the broader scale marketing and recruitment, but you know what? Our enrollments have gone down. There's a lot of competition out there. And the dem demography of our high school classes is basically flat for the next decade. So we're not gonna ride a wave up that universities around the country have done in, in recent decades. We're gonna be flat. That means we've gotta go make these partnerships. Middle schools, high schools, community colleges, businesses. And we have to be relevant in that triangle to show there's that value proposition. It does take a whole village. It takes all of us. When we get them here, we also have to get them graduated. And uh, to that end, last year in the Bold Futures workshop, we got feedback from students that sometimes the Husky Shuffle happened and that the customer service wasn't what they kind of expected. They got shifted from place to place. And so our marketing and communications folks came up with the Ask Me campaign. And we've got posters on the, uh, you know, on the poles around the campus. We've really tried to celebrate people that are doing that great job of, of reaching out and, and treating students the way that we would want our children to be treated or we ourselves would want to be treated. So uh, we didn't put everybody up there. Everybody is, is working on this. If you want to volunteer to be on a, on a pole somewhere, let me know. <laughs> we'll put your pictures up. But we do have four folks here today that I'd like to celebrate and I think I would ask them to stand as I say a few words about them or you can stand, wave and sit back down if you're more comfortable doing that. Uh, first, uh, Shanna Ware, who's uh, Advocacy Services Coordinator in Counseling and Student Development. Hi. 
Shanna is from Chicago, from the south suburbs, and came here as a student. Uh, she got a bachelor's in public health in 2009, master's in 2012 in adult and higher education, and her aha moment was the opportunity for her to make the most uh, of the opportunity that was in front of her, the mentors and professors that influenced her. That, that uh, She got a great deal out of those relationships. And she got her first full-time job a week after graduation in May of 2012 at NIU. And she enjoys the pace of life here in DeKalb and is very grateful for the opportunity she got and the chance that was given to her. So. Thank you for your good work now in advocacy and uh, as advocacy services coordinator. Uh, Constance Irvins. Constance, hi. She is an admissions counselor. Pretty important as we work on these recruitment issues. Constance joined us in admissions uh, as a counselor last semester. She earned, uh, she's been at NIU since coming as an undergraduate in 2008, and was heavily involved in campus activities such as her sorority as a reporter for the Northern Star and later as a worker in the Office of Media and Public Relations while working toward her degree in uh, journalism and Spanish. Uh, she earned her master's in communication studies last year and she loves the diversity represented on our campuses and enjoys telling prospective students about all the opportunities for NIU students as they grow personally and professionally here. Uh, Asia Flowers uh, is not here with us today, but Asia, you can see her on a poll near you, uh, is a financial aid advisor and coordinator in, in student financial aid, another really critical piece. Uh, she's from Cortland, was a, uh, has been here since 2008 as a student and uh, got her bachelor's degree in 2012. She enjoys the dynamic between peers, counselors, and students, helping students to be able to pay for college. And, Boy, how impactful is that when you sit down with a student and talk to them about their finances and show them, yes, you can do this. We do have support. We can help you through this. Alex Gelman, professor and director of the School and Theater of Arts and Dance. Hi, Alex. Alex hails from Sycamore and has always been a strong advocate for students in the theater and dance program. Uh, just try and ask him about it. Stop him on the sidewalk, and I'm sure he will uh, do quite well telling you about it. Um, you know, his alums are very successful. They've been in Hollywood, on Broadway, off-Broadway, in Chicago, on television and movies, uh, behind the scenes, uh, designing the scenes, designing the sets, executing the plays. Uh, as, a producing as a producing artistic director for the Organic Theater Company of Chicago, he works with NIU alums on a regular basis, uh, and that's a big deal. If you haven't been there, check it out. It's a lot of fun. Uh, he's that, got that same passion for students on our campus, and uh, we're really proud of the way Alex has been working with our students and helping his department reach out and help students succeed. So thanks to all of you for your great work. That kind of relationship, that relationship building helps build uh, the attachment that students want and need and helps them be successful. Retention is critically important here. It's recruiting, but it's also helping students stay and succeed. Uh, we've got a lot going on, and uh, Vice Provost Ann Bergberg is going to come up now and talk to us about a few of the programs we have underway. Ann? Thank you. Thank you, President Baker. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, as President Baker said, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our retention efforts. Um, if you saw the Northern Star this morning, you read that fall to spring retention is at 87%. And that's average. That's royal in the range of the five-year average. And it's a slight dip from where it was last year by 1.2%. But I know that all of you have expressed great concern and have adopted retention as an effort. So it's not only your concern, but your commitment and the creativity that you have shown in um, developing new initiatives and, again, supporting initiatives that are underway. So we know why students decide to leave. We've asked them. And I've put on the, board, on the screen the top five reasons. 
And I know that your initiatives have all kind of tried to address these reasons. And I want to thank you on behalf of everybody for the work that you've done. And there's still a lot to do, and we need to stay the course because retention doesn't turn around in the semester or in a year. It's a long-term commitment. But what I'd like to do this afternoon is just speak briefly about three initiatives that have proven to be successful. And the first of these is MapWorks. We've had MapWorks here on campus for six years. MapWorks is a series of surveys that students are given in their first year. And there are three surveys, two launch in the fall and one in the spring. And what happens is that students who take the survey can go in and they can look at their results. And in looking at the results, it provides them a moment of self-check and self-reflection. But faculty and staff can also go in and look at those results. And the reason that that is a great idea is that MapWorks can serve as a tool for early intervention. And the faculty and staff can do these three things. They can assist students to transition to college, they can identify students who are at risk, and they can connect students with the resources that are going to be of help to those students. So as you can see, MapWorks takes an entire university. It takes a community. It's not just a solo act. And for all of those who have participated in MapWorks and have helped out, we give you our thanks. We know that if students take MapWorks, good things happen. And there's a list of the good things that happen to the students. And that all culminates into their returning to NIU. And if they return to NIU, they persist. And we get to where we want to get, which is the final act. And that is they graduate, and they walk across the stage, and they shake President Baker's hand and get their diploma. And that's what we're all about, and that's what we want to do. So we need your help. Next slide. Oh, before we need you, we do need your help, but let me just give you a quick data slide on the benefits of MapWorks. So this is just two years worth of data. You can see that the students who take MapWorks have a higher GPA. We can go back and this data repeats itself over the six years we've done it. And now I wanna talk about how we need your help because we do need your help. The third survey is about to launch. It's a hard survey for us to get students to take because the students are dispersed throughout campus. They're not necessarily in courses where we can reach out to them. So help us. If you know students who are first year students, if you know students who are new transfers, urge them to take the MapWorks survey. You just saw a slide that shows the advantages of MapWorks. Let's continue that. If you have questions about MapWorks, contact the Office of Student Academic Success, OSAS at niu.edu, and we also put a phone number down. The second initiative that I'd like to talk about is freshman composition. Freshman composition offers an ideal venue to connect with students. The classes are small, the instruction is highly individualized, lot of interaction between instructor and student. So when we did the Bold Futures workshops, it was kind of a natural that the folks who were in FY Comp should start to talk about how can they elevate, how can they leverage what they're already doing and take it to a new level and establish even stronger and better and greater connections with students. And out of those bold future workshops and the leader, leadership retreats came the program of peer advocates. And a peer advocate is a student who has gone through first year comp and returns and serves as a mentor to the students who are currently in a first year comp class. And that peer advocate works with the students and works with the faculty member. And it's only within the last couple of days that we've looked at some of the data from this past fall semester. And what we've discovered is that students who have freshman comp with a peer advocate return at 85% versus students who are in sections that don't have peer advocates. But that number is just a piece of the story. Really what is important is what stands behind that number, and that is the attitudinal and effective changes that happen with the students. The students feel 
more engaged in their learning. This is what they've reported to us. They feel more connected to the university. They feel a greater willingness to go on and complete their degree, walk across that stage. But it's not just the students in the class, it's also the peer advocates who have reported that the experience of being a peer advocate is a meaningful and enriching experience for them. And again, this program is speaking and addressing what the students have told us, and that is they want to connect with their peers, and this program has allowed them to do so. The final initiative I'd like to look at is not a program, it's high impact practices. And President Baker highlighted some of those with Antarctica Educate USA um, and, and those previous slides. So high impact practices are traditionally referred to as HIPs. And I will tell you that NIU is a very hip university. We're, we're, we're great, we're hipsters, our students are hipsters, our faculty are hipsters, we're really hip. And there's a wide range of activities involved with hips. And the HIP practices are the triangle strategy in action. They exemplify it. And so this is, these are practices we want to promote. These are practices we want to invest in. And one of the things that we've done recently is we've established the Student Engagement Fund. And this fund is a collaboration with the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and the Office of Student Engagement and Experiential Learning. And what it has done is it's made better use of disparate pots of money and it's brought them together so that we can support undergraduate students who are engaged in research and other engagement activities. The other thing that this partnership and collaboration has done is it streamed line processes. If you remember, President Baker asked you, do you know processes that aren't working, that are cumbersome? Well, this is one that is no longer cumbersome. So the Student Engagement Fund is working on multiple levels. In the spirit of strategic partnerships and efficiencies, what I'd like to now do is turn over the podium to Provost Freeman, who's going to talk about program prioritization. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Oops, I don't want that. <laughs> Thank you, Anne, and good afternoon, everybody. I think most people sitting in the audience probably know that NIU is embarking on the program prioritization process. I've spoken about this to a number of groups. President Baker put it in a Baker report, and Kelly Bauer did an outstanding article that's front page and above the fold in today's Northern Star. But even knowing that, I think a lot of people don't know what it really means. What is program prioritization, and why are we doing it? And I want to thank Vice Provost for recognizing that it's about effectiveness and efficiency and partnerships and synergy, and it is not just a budget-cutting exercise. Program prioritization is something that universities should do in flush times and in lean times, because it reminds us on a regular basis to ask the questions President Baker was alluding to when he talked about process redesign. What should we be doing? What should we be starting? What should we be stopping? What should we just keep on doing like we are doing it now? And we want to answer those questions in a prioritization process using data, using data to align our strategic plan and our strategic goals with our budget and expenditures, to enhance efficiency and the efficacy of all of our programs, academic and non-academic programs, and to strengthen NIU in the process. And we're not alone in embarking on program prioritization. Recently, there was a survey of over 100 universities. The sample had public universities and private universities, four-year and two-year research and comprehensive. And about half of those schools were already involved in program prioritization, and another quarter were starting. This doesn't mean that we're behind the eight ball. What it means is that there's a lot of experience out there that we can draw upon. So as we create a program prioritization that's right for NIU, we can learn from the experience of others. There are a number of basic elements to program prioritization. You need 
guiding principles, sort of you know, boundary limits or uh, ground rules for what you're going to do, what's on the table, what's not on the table. You need an inventory of programs. You have to know how many programs you have and what their names are so you can do the program prioritization. And you need criteria for evaluating the programs. You need to have templates and formats so that the programs that are making their cases, that are advocating for their futures, have an easy way of telling their story, both quantitatively and qualitatively. You need review panels or task forces that will look at all the data that comes in and help to rank or prioritize the program. And you need a system for doing that, and then you need processes for connecting those findings to action steps. These aren't things that are already in place here or at most universities. And these aren't things that you can do overnight by flipping a switch. The experience of other universities has shown us it takes at least a year to really roll out a program prioritization process. So where are we on the timeline? Last fall, we started to talk about and explore program prioritization as an option for NIU. We developed a coordinating team, and I'm going to talk about that a little more in a few slides. And we started letting the campus know we were going down this road. This spring, we've established guiding principles. We will be developing criteria for program evaluation with broad impact from the people in this audience and others across our university community. And we will be asking people to nominate folks for those task forces, for the panels that will be doing the program prioritization. Next fall, the programs will be receiving data so that they can analyze it and tell their stories. And then the task force reviews will be begin, and the task forces, one for academic programs, one for administrative programs, will prioritize or categorize the programs into five groups. And what are those five groups going to be named? I don't know at this point, but I know what the possible outcomes will be. Programs will have the opportunity to be enriched, to stay the same, to be reconfigured, to create more synergy, or to be diminished. In spring 16, we will start to take the budget for fiscal year 17 and use the results of the program prioritization to inform our resource allocation. So program prioritization will not be affecting any budget until fiscal 17. If we get a surprise from the state, as the president indicated, we would be not shocked to see a budget cut next year. We won't be accelerating program prioritization. This is a different type of process. So I talked about having a coordinating team. This past fall, there was a conference in Chicago where some of the leaders in higher education who have a great understanding of program prioritization were in attendance. There were 20 schools at that conference, none from Illinois, no Illinois publics, but one of our sister institutions, a Mac institution, Western Michigan, was there. And we took 11 people to this conference. It was close to us. It was easy. And we wanted to make sure that we took a team not only that had perspectives from across campus and key roles in our shared governance process, but also that we took the folks who really had the expertise to facilitate the building and implementation of the process for program prioritization at NIU. Many of those folks were in the audience for the last town hall. I know that some of them are here. As I say your name, if you're in the audience, please stand up so folks know who you are now and for the rest of the time that we're doing program prioritization. We took Jeff Reynolds, who's a data analyst from the Office of the Provost. Ibrahim Abdelmodalib, an engineering professor. I know he's not here because he's in Saudi Arabia. He's the chair of our Resource, Space, and Budget Committee, our shared governance committee that helps the president, provost, and CFO make budget decisions. Sue Minnie from the provost's office, vice provost for resource and planning, a key person in terms of allocation of human resources, space, and financial resources in the academic units. Those three individuals are making up the data subcommittee of our team and they'll be working in a way that will become apparent as we go through the presentation. Bill Pitney, faculty senate president and executive secretary of the University Council came. He represents shared governance across all of the NIA, uh, NIU communities. Brett Coriel, our chief information officer, he represented cabinet level divisions, but we also know that information technology will be important in communications and data presentation. Mark Falkoff, a professor from the College of Law, 
who's been the chair of the Academic Planning Council of Faculty Senate, the shared governance committee that does program review and thinks about how programs can grow and increase their enrollment and their impact. That group is really be, being tasked with being the subcommittee for implementation. They're creating the survey that will be used to ask the campus community about criteria, and then they will go ahead and build after that the nomination process for task force members. Denise Schoenbeckler, the dean of the College of Business, who's a longtime Husky, great leadership perspective, and also a marketing background, was part of our team. Andy Small, former chair of operating staff council and who's still playing a statewide role with the State University Civil Service System. Kelly Westner Michael, associate vice president in student affairs and dean of students who brings an important lens about programs that happen that aren't administrative, aren't academic and have a high impact on students. Denise and Andy and Kelly are our marketing subgroup. Carolyn De Douglas, the vice president for academic programs is serving sort of as the overall facilitator for the process and of course I'm trying to help in every way that I possibly can. I really want to emphasize that this is a coordinating team. They will be playing a facilitatory role as a team. They will not be making decisions. They will be taking information in and out, making sure that the campus is well informed. Our communication sub team is already working with marketing and communications and IT and the provost staff and others on campus. We have a website that will be going live next week. On that website, we'll have this presentation. We'll have frequently asked questions. We'll have a box where you can anonymously make comments or ask questions. Our data support team is working with the people on our campus who are the stewards of data, institutional research, registration and records, academic analysis and reporting, sponsored projects, and also with the folks who understand what the programs will need, what format they might want it in, what are the particular needs of one program or another to build the data platforms to make sure that we have a process for supporting folks as they analyze the data and turn in their narratives. So what are the ground rules? What are our guiding principles? Well, first, our first guiding principle is that there are no sacred cows. All programs will be subject to program prioritization. And no decisions are being made in advance, and no decisions are being made based on anything other than data. So those are our overall guiding principles. I also want to say that programs that might be diminished as a result of this process, we diminish programs now. And when we do that, we honor the contracts of all our employees. We guarantee that students who are in academic programs that may be discontinued are taught out. They can finish their degrees. We'll continue to do that. What really is a program? And we use that word in a lot of different contexts. In program prioritization, the word program has a very particular meaning. It's an activity or a collection of activities that consumes resources. And these can be dollars, people, space, equipment, or time. A program is not a department. A department is not a program. Academic programs and administrative programs general, or academic departments and administrative departments or divisions generally contain multiple programs. If you think about an academic department, it may have a bachelor's program, a master's program, a PhD program, a cluster of general education courses. It may do some contract teaching. It may have a research institute. All of those would be programs within a department. If you think of an administrative program, I like to use the example of athletics to ensure everybody that athletics is not a sacred cow. There are lots of different sports. There are men's and women's teams. There are operations. There's compliance. There's advising. There's probably stuff I don't know about that goes on in athletics. All of those are individual programs. And then in the context of program prioritization, when we use the words academic and administrative, they also have very specific meanings. So academic programs are the ones I spoke to you about. They're generally instructional degree research oriented programs. When we do program prioritization, there are things that we may think of often as academic, our library, advising, that for the purpose of this exercise are classified as administrative. That's a best practice that's evolved across many campuses because it provides those op programs all the best opportunity to make their case. So what are the criteria that we will use to evaluate programs? I don't know yet. 
It's a work in progress, and we need you to help with that. There was a book published in the mid-90s by Robert Dickinson called Prioritizing Academic Programs and Services. And these are the 10 criteria that he suggested campuses use. Some campuses have used these exactly as you see here. Most campuses haven't. They've adopted them to their culture. There are many things in these criteria that are attractive. The criteria are both quantitative and qualitative. They speak not just to cost and numbers, but to the history and the importance of the program to the institution over time. They provide an opportunity for programs to show, if you gave me more resources, look how much more I could do with them. And they provide obvious places for students and alumni to provide input into the program narrative. Not a bad starting point. But 10 criteria, that's a long list. Many campuses collapse them. And here's an alternative version. Here they've taken those 10 criteria and collapsed them into five. Importance to the university, external and internal demand are together. Quality is still there. There's still an opportunity analysis. Some campuses have used these criteria for both academic and administrative programs and asked slightly different questions under the major headings. Again, we don't know what our criteria will be looking like. But we'll be asking you, we'll be launching a survey and asking you to comment on the number of criteria, the nature of the criteria, how they should be weighted. There'll be a place to write in criteria. And we expect that survey to launch in February. What about the two task forces? One will look at academic programs. One will look at administrative programs. They'll be doing the actual prioritization. The academic task force will be all faculty and there'll be representatives from all seven colleges. But I want to make an important point. There'll be representatives from seven colleges for collective wisdom, not because each of those faculty member is going to be arguing and protecting the programs in their college or their department or that they teach in. We're really looking for people who have a more institutional view. The same will be true on the administrative side. We want faculty and staff from all 10 divisions. But just as on the academic side, we want folks with what we're calling a trustee mentality, folks who've been here long enough to have a long-term perspective and who can put NIU and the institution and its long-term sustainability ahead of their short-term um, self-interest. We also want people who are servant leaders, people who, when they've been asked to serve on things that are time consuming and hard before, have shown up and done the work. That's why we're going to ask people to nominate their peers for this task force. We'll be launching a form and a submission process in March. We don't want to launch it before the criteria are determined. And um, these will be selected by the president, provost, CFO, and the executive secretary of the university council. When I looked at that bullet, I just remembered, I didn't say what's going to happen with the survey data for the criteria, so let me take a minute and tell you that now. They'll be fed back to a joint task force of the Resource, Space, and Budget Committee and the Academic Planning Council. That group will be supplemented with others so that we have a little bit broader perspective. We expect to invite students to serve on that task force. That task force will be defining the final set of criteria or that group. So let me end with a call to action. What should you be doing now? What should you be thinking about as we move forward in program prioritization? Definitely participate in the survey that we're going to launch next month. That's your opportunity to say, these are the criteria that I think fit NIU's culture. Think about who you might want to nominate for a task force. Anyone can make a nomination. We'll want to pick the best people from our faculty and staff to serve on those task forces. And then start thinking about your own programs. What are the things that you want to put forward? Are there new programs that your division has been dying to launch, but resource constraints have not allowed that? Are there programs that can be reconfigured, combined, greater collaborations or partnerships done for process reengineering and greater efficiency? Do you want to start doing that now in preparation? And are there programs that are on your books that haven't really been viable for a long time, but you just have kind of had inertia and never taken them off? Do you want to wait for program prioritization, or do you want to start moving those resources elsewhere on your own? These are the things that you can be doing now. With that, I'm going to invite President Baker back up here, and Vice Provost Berberk is still here, and we will, um, all of us, take your questions on any subject. Thank you for your attention.
So we're still streaming. So if you do have questions, come up to one of the microphones so the people online can hear. Who's first? She faked us out. <laughs> you should have asked before you left, you know? Huh. Oh, that's good. Taking care of kids is good. Ooh, here we go. Yay. Hi there, I'm Erin Sherrill. I'm with Housing and Dining Marketing. Hi, um, just wondering if there's any plan to expand MapWork so that students can fill out the survey over several years or throughout their whole program here. Um, I think that that could be useful. Here's Ann. Good question. We've been asked that before. Uh, right now, it is used just for first-year students, and we have been exploring um, scaling it up for sophomores. And what we've discovered is that the cost is actually pretty reasonable, and we could do it. But we've also discovered in talking to other institutions that we have um, a problem of students actually not taking it because it's really easy to get the students in the first year. They take it because they've been urged in UNIV 101 or FY Comp or Comps 100 or they live in the residence halls and their CA urges them. And that's one of the struggles we have in this between the fall and the spring, and then it becomes even harder and more challenging in their sophomore year and in their junior year and in their senior year. So we've been having discussions about it, and we're exploring ways to do that, but uh, we do think MapWorks is good, and we would love to scale it up, but we need to figure out how to get the students to take the surveys. So if you have ideas about how to get students to take the survey, please let me know because I am interested in hearing them. Thanks. President, President. Yes. President Baker, we do have a, a question from online. Um, Mayor Emanuel has passed free tuition for Chicago City Colleges. Do you see that impacting our enrollment efforts? Um, I, I, that's probably a two-edged sword. If more students are going to go into community colleges, it may create uh, a, a recruiting opportunity for us from those schools. So, you know, that, that's the positive side of it. We should be in the city colleges, and we've been trying to form partnerships, uh, particularly with Malcolm X. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I uh, met the new president, Tony Monroe, at Malcolm X, a wonderful guy with a healthcare background. And uh, we're at the new president's workshop uh, for uh, American Council on Education which was held in Chicago. And uh, so we ran into each other and struck up a friendship, and we've been talking about how our schools could work more closely together. So in the interim, uh, we have a proposal uh, off to an accreditor about a joint uh, physician assistant program we might teach with them. Uh, so the accreditor has a very long accreditation review process, so it might take a little bit of time. But that would really be an interesting partnership to have students come out of those community colleges and come here. Uh, they're, they're also looking uh, for us to potentially partner with them on their campus. They're building a beautiful new building uh, between the uh, Malcolm X uh, current college and the United Center, and that uh, it's about a $240 million building that's going up, and they have a healthcare focus. So uh, they've asked to talk to us about could we offer classes in situ there for their students so they wouldn't have to come out here, could we actually teach two plus two kinds of programs there for their students and for their staff. They're interested in a number of their staff wanting additional um, educational opportunities. So we're gonna continue to work there. That's the positive side. The downside might be there's a few less students going out into universities uh, early on in the first two years. So I think we, if that turned out to be the case, we just want to capitalize on it and uh, capitalize on all those additional students and recruit them here. Next. Uh, we'll wait. And thanks for using the microphones. It's easier to hear online. Hi, President Baker. I'm Tricia Maxwell. Um, I'm a staff and also a student at large currently this semester um, after 20 years of graduating from NIU, so back here. Um, I just was curious, you're doing a lot of work with the mayor of DeKalb to bring the city in to help 
do things for the, with the city to make it a better environment for the students. Can you kind of give us an update if there's anything with that? You know, it's, uh, it's really interesting. We're, we're working closely with the city on a variety of things. We meet with a, a, our leadership team and his leadership team meets on a regular basis, about a monthly basis, and we talk about things. I see Jennifer Gross here, who's uh, uh, kind of my lead person with the city, who's working on a variety of issues, including a, a needs assessment for some of our neighborhoods for what are the services and opportunities they need and uh, some of our researchers working in those communities. Um, we're, we're talking about, uh, I see the chief here, I know the chief is working with his counterparts in uh, law enforcement on joint policing with uh, joint strategic planning, uh, sh uh, meeting, meet, we meeting on a weekly basis about policing activities, joint rides, poli uh, you know, doing um, uh, integrated policing activities. Um, we now have interoperable radio systems between the police forces that didn't used to exist. We bought those last year so we could talk with all local law enforcement and have a coordinated activity there. Uh, on the fire side, we worked with the city to help fund a uh, fire truck, a ladder truck, last year. Uh, their ladder truck was dying and turns out almost all the tall buildings in town are ours. So we thought it would be a good idea to have a ladder truck in case there was ever a fire so that we could get to the upper stories and buildings. Uh, so that was a good partnership. Uh, we're working on economic development activities. And uh, uh, we're trying to also even work with uh, faith groups that uh, Jennifer and I have been meeting with, the Association of Campus Religious Organizations, to think about what are the pro-social kinds of things we can work on with the city, the business community, uh, the city itself and us and I think I, uh, there's some real opportunities there that's an example of the triangle working how students and faculty could work with the city or faith groups or uh, the business community to work on projects and activities in the community so we've got a lot going on you're welcome you might want to mention that Mayor Ray was at the last town hall yeah the, he, he was at the last town hall that's right Jennifer do you want to add anything to that Yeah, we're working countywide, uh, and we, Jennifer and I had lunch uh, with the Sycamore Chamber of Commerce today. There was almost 400 people there at the Sycamore Chamber celebrating their 100th anniversary and talking, yeah, congratulations to them. That's great. They've done a lot over the years. Very vibrant community with a lot of good things going on, and one we're also trying to partner with Mayor Mundy and his crew. Yeah, oh, Brad has a question. Uh, are there any plans to expand more affordable housing to students uh, since the demolition of Douglas Hall and the shutdown of Lincoln Hall? So uh, I think Neptune continues to be an opportunity there for the, the lower price. And we're examining what to do uh, with Lincoln. Uh, right now, with our declining enrollment, it doesn't justify reopening it. Uh, my hope is we can do that and that we keep housing and uh, food costs down. So in terms of tuition, room, and board last year, uh, we kept it flat. We had a small increase in tuition and an equivalent reduction in room and board. So freshmen two years ago paid the same, this year paid what they did the year before. And in the coming year, the students will pay less, about $560 less. And uh, so we had a slight increase in tuition and a much bigger decrease in uh, room and board, mostly board. I think it was about a $560 drop for students c next year. And so if you're continuing on campus, you'll ha have a reduction as well in room and board for next year. So that's great. But that sets, and we're doing that because the tuition has gone up so much over the years with the state budget cuts uh, that we've gotten to a place where we're pricing students out of the market. So that, if we cap it like we've done or even start decreasing it a little bit, that's gonna put pressure on us to find the revenues or decrease the expenses to run the university. So that's why program prioritization is gonna be so critical to us to look at how do we spend our resources efficiently and effectively to fulfill our mission? How do we best serve our students with those resources? And we can all think of ways to be more efficient, effective in this place. There's so many processes you could all kind of write down on the back of an envelope that you would like to take four of the 12 steps out of or eight of the 12 steps out of. We can do those kinds of things if we work together. So we need to keep those costs down. 
another one here uh, submitted. During program prioritization, will input be gathered across the academic slash administration areas? In other words, will faculty participate in prioritizing administrative programs and vice versa? So um, let me try to address that by going over the process components. Programs will be making their own cases and doing their own data analysis. So data will be provided to the programs to fit what's, what is under a work in progress in terms of what will be the type of data and the type of format that allows programs that are relatively different to all have a similar format to make an important case. And I say that because we have task forces that need to have a manageable task. And we have, as any great university has, a diversity of programs where the metrics to show how wonderful the program are may vary. And we'll be working to make sure that programs are able to make a strong case. Those submissions, the data, the narrative, will go to the panels. There will be one panel for review of administrative programs and one panel for review of academic programs. The academic program panel will be comprised entirely of faculty in accordance with our shared governance tenant that faculty own the curriculum. Those will be degree programs, curricular initiatives, research programs, and those are the purview of faculty. And this is not something we made up, actually, either. It's pretty much the way it's done on every campus that does program prioritization. In contrast, the panel that assesses or prioritizes the administrative programs, and again, those are um, payroll, snow removal, advising. I mean, there's a spectrum of programs that we would consider administrative in this process. That panel will have representation from faculty and staff. Any follow up on that one? No? Okay, I think you were next. Second. Hello everyone, my name is Rosa Campos. I'm a graduate student in the uh, program of adult and higher ed. And in this meeting, you have talked about the retention of students. I would like to ask about the retention of faculty and professional staff. Is there something being done about it? You wanna start and I'll... Okay. You know, that's, that's a great topic, and a lot of it comes down, uh, people think, just to compensation. That is an important part of it, and we have not had a raise at the university in, what, three years? Uh, so we've got to work on that. We've got to get the revenues up and the, the expenses down so we can allocate to compensation increases, and that's critically important. Another piece has been trying to get people to work together on these common problems through the Bold Futures workshops last year, through town hall meetings, and through the the triangle strategy now to go out into units and try and figure out how do we move the institution forward? What can we do to help fulfill our mission? So those are some of the things that we're working on. Uh, there are recognition programs that I know the provost has been working on and uh, the students at the uh, uh, university council meeting yesterday announced that they were gonna have a recognition program for faculty and staff at the university. Lisa? I guess you know the other thing I would say is when you look at the list of things that makes make students think about leaving, a lot of the same themes emerge when we talk to faculty and staff. Compensation is a piece, but it's not the only piece. It's about connectedness, and it's about community, and it's about feeling appreciated. And so awards are part of that. Having a more robust human resources function that values and develops employees throughout the life cycle is another piece of that. We lose very good people, sometimes to things beyond our control, like the State of Illinois Pension Reform Act, but we sometimes lose people because they need to leave the university to advance in their careers. And if there are people who are dedicated Huskies, we should be able to find a way within our human resources function to keep people here and allow them to advance in their careers to a greater extent than we do. And that's something we need to work hard on. Um, thriving communities is one of the three pillars, and we've talked about community in DeKalb and Sycamore. I know that the city of DeKalb and the city of Sycamore are very interested in working with the university to keep faculty and staff living close to the university. 
One of the initiatives that came up in a recent conversation with Jennifer Gross and me and our DeKalb leadership is, are there grant programs out there that we can leverage to help students, faculty, and staff have more affordable housing and make DeKalb and Sycamore more desirable places for them to live? That's something that we want to look at. And then there are other things where I think you know, the community can really help. We may not be able to give everybody raises, but perhaps we could work with some of the entertainment or shop, shopping venues in the community to get better employee discounts. You know, that's another thing that human resources could be working on, and that's a way that you start bringing everybody together. So I agree with you. I think it's really important. We don't want to, from the faculty standpoint, be like the, the farm team for the baseball team. We don't want people to come here, prove that they're great teachers, wonderful scholars, researchers, and artists, and then use, have that be the way that they enable themselves to leave. We want them to come here maybe thinking I might not stay my whole career there and say this is the best place I've ever been. They treat me really well. I love the students. I love our mission. And um, 20 years have gone by like that. And that's what we want to work for towards together as a community and within our human resources function. So great question. Hi, I'm Terry Borg. I'm from the College of Education. And I want to change, change the topic slightly. Um, with Ray Alden's announcement that uh, he's departing NIU soon, and your emphasis on internationalization of our campus. I'm wondering if you can give us some insight what you're thinking about in terms of that division, if things will be changing, or what your perspectives are. Yeah, great question. And uh, Ray Alden is the Vice President for uh, Global Affairs. Um, I met with the staff this week, actually, and uh, we had lunch a couple days ago and talk to, through those issues. Uh, Ray's off to uh, Henderson, Nevada, where he'll be a provost at a health sciences uh, college there and be close to his three grandbabies, which I think his wife is very excited about, as is he. Um, we clearly have to have a stronger global presence. We have to have these uh, great opportunities in the triangle uh, map to have students and faculty having opportunities in international arenas with study abroad, research abroad, etc. It's just life transforming and we've become a global society and we need to be culturally literate in that regard. So we need more of our folks going overseas and then we need more students from overseas coming here to enrich our campus. Uh, this fall we were up a couple hundred international students. Uh, I know there's been a lot of hard work in a number of colleges to increase it even more. We have some pending uh, programs like two plus two programs, two years in another country, two here that could be very helpful in that regard where you know a few hundred students would be coming. So, uh, so we need to continue to build those pipelines and then we need to build the services to support the students that come here from overseas as well as ours that go over. So it's an area that we need to really uh, have in place. Uh, we're about a week into his announcement, and so we haven't thought through all the particulars. Um, I think what Lisa and I would like to do uh, in April, when uh, Ray actually does leave, is to pull that over and have it integrated in the provost's office, at least temporarily, um, and maybe permanently, so that all those academic pieces we've been working on over the last year where we're doing these two plus two kinds of programs that are really articulating our academics with uh, other schools overseas, can be more efficiently done through the provost's office and the colleges and the deans. So uh, we'll do that for a while and we're gonna be studying that and, and how to refill those positions. But we'll, uh, we'll do a national or international search and get a good person into that. Brad. Not necessarily for me, but from online, I'm just... Okay, Brad's reading the, the questions coming in on the computer. So uh, many universities' financial security are greatly helped with fundraising such as donors and alumni, research and intercollegiate athletics. The CFO indicated that these are insignificant for NIU. Are there plans to change that? Yes. Oh. <laughs> um, we've had one uh, capital campaign, one fundraising campaign for this university. We're a little bit unusual. Uh, most schools our size are two, three, four campaigns old. Uh, that's good news and bad news. The good news is we don't have donor fatigue. You know, sometimes you, after four campaigns, the donors are like, uh, enough already. Uh, uncle. Not our case. We have 240,000 alumni, let alone all the other stakeholders, uh, foundations and corporations, not-for-profits that are interested in us. 
Uh, so we need to put together a capital campaign that's linked to our triangle map that's going to fund student scholarships to help them with affordability, that's going to help faculty with endowments and program support, that's going to help us in our outreach activities and in our facilities. So uh, we really need to work on all of those. And to that end, uh, you probably know that uh, two years ago, Mike Malone announced his retirement. It was a two-year retirement phase. It's a, it's a long retirement phase, but I appreciate him being here the last two years, my first two years. Uh, and we did a national search this year. It turned out to be an international search. One of the faculty members was from, or applicants was from Singapore. Uh, and uh, this week we announced the hiring of the new vice president who will start May 1st. Her name's Catherine Squires. She's uh, currently the vice president for advancement at Tufts Medical. And part of that, she was uh, uh, at Red Cross of Illinois running fundraising for them out of Chicago and is a uh, graduate of visual and performing arts. She was a horn major, uh, French horn as I remember. And so went on and had this, uh, she's had a number of other jobs, but those were the last two very successful at Tufts um, and put together an excellent campaign there. So I'm really excited to have her on board and helping with all of us build the architecture for that next capital campaign, work with all of us to set the priorities on what are the key things we need to raise money for and then go do that. So yes, it is going to be a much more significant piece of our budget. If I can add to that, um, during her interview and after she accepted the position, I had a marvelous conversation with Catherine about how program prioritization could work with the beginnings of a campaign, the pre-planning process, because out of the program prioritization process, as the programs tell their narrative and needs and opportunities are identified, those could be philanthropic targets. And although we are likely to identify needs all across campus, not all needs are good philanthropic targets. We have a lot of deferred maintenance, and I've yet to see a donor who wants to donate HVAC or fill a pipe with their nameplate. But we'll have wonderful things that come out in terms of opportunities for student scholarships and student support and research and all the things the questioner asked about that Catherine can then build a case around for the capital campaign. So we both feel very lucky to be starting on these processes together. Great, thanks. Another one, one from Brad? Brad? Yep, okay. they're coming in. Uh, it seems as though you have many specific plans, but are continuously still in the, quote, works and thinking processes, processes on ways to enhance faculty and staff retention and raises. Why not a detailed public plan like we saw today so the visions can be shared? Well, you may have seen the beginnings of that detailed public plan in the program prioritization process. The reality is we had a $15 million budget deficit last year, and we needed to decide how to solve that. And we did it by reducing employment and operating budgets. Um, I guess we could have reduced more employment and then put that into compensation. But until we rethink our systems and make more efficient systems, it seems like we're already straining people enough. So we didn't do that. So we are another step or two out uh, as we do program prioritization and then do our process reengineering to make us more efficient. So that, that's where we are in the development of it. Follow-ups on that or others? You have another. You're in a roll. If NIU can find an extra $800,000 for the new cost of athletic attendance scholarships, won't that take away from money that might go towards retaining students who are not student athletes who already get substantial support? Uh, for those of you who haven't been following this NCAA debate, uh, there's uh, been a question raised about should universities pay for cost of attendance for student athletes? Given all that they do, do we owe them cost of attendance? And um, the NCAA and now Matt, the MAC has said yes, we will support cost of attendance. I think it's a couple thousand dollars of additional money per student for us here at NIU. And I did actually meet with the athletic director today about that, and he's going to start carving that out of his existing budget. So it won't come from the central budget, but from out of his revenues and his reallocation and his process reengineering that he's doing in athletics. Is that it? You, are you sure? I'm standing by. Okay. Who else has a question here? 
Looks like we got two minutes, unless you want to call it early. Anybody? Well, if not, I will say it's inter there's, these are interesting times. The university's been through some tough times with state budget reductions for some period of time. We've had declining enrollments. But I feel good about um, the faculty, the staff, the leadership, the students of this university. Um, I'm inspired every time I meet with students and, and what they're doing and uh, the energy they have and the values they have and what they're trying to do to prepare themselves for a better life and society to be better. And uh, I guess uh, I'm just so buoyed by what they're doing that I, I think our future is bright. So I want to thank for all of you for helping them be successful and for your scholarship and artistry that moves society forward and that we're going to get through these challenging times and be a stronger organization coming out the other side. Let's go Huskies. President Baker, President, can we have, do we have time for just one more? Uh, all right. It is 427, so we're going to get past that. Um, this was a follow-up to the athletics question. How much does athletics contribute to the university? Um, well, there are qualitative and quantitative. We, they provide a national stage for us, obviously, when we're on TV with various sporting activities. People know about NIU all over the country because of them, so it's a little bit hard to say what all the second and third order effects are. I was on an escalator in Portland, Oregon last year, and I had an NIU shirt on, and some guy came up and talked to me about our athletic programs and asked who I was. And then I was, uh, and then when I got done with him, some other woman came up and said, are you from NIU? I graduated from there. And she was a marketing director somewhere downtown in Portland. So I, I think athletics brings a lot to us. And they also bring community, you know, when we go to athletic events and whatnot. Uh, so the, those are great. And you'll see that tomorrow night for those of you going to the Castle Challenge over in the Convocation Center, another community building activity for the broader community. All right, now you can go.